Welcome to Insights. Uh, I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today, managing anger, your own, and dealing with the anger of others, and we may even touch on road rage. Our guest is Daryl Hanusa. Daryl has worked for 30 years treating abusive men and counseling their survivors. For 25 years, he's been lecturing at the University of Wisconsin on domestic abuse. He also works for the United States Air Force on the same subject. Daryl, thanks a lot for joining us. You're welcome. You know, outside of physical abuse, that wasn't what I intended we talk about today. How prevalent do you think in America, or the world, is poor use of managing anger? Do most people do it very well, or do you think all of us have something to learn here? Well, that's a really good question. So I would ask you to think about this question yourself. Okay. And the question that I ask every patient that I work with is this. How often in your lifetime have you had a chance to see people who at the point where they were very angry express that level of intense anger in a calm and constructive <laughs> way? And almost always what I, and there are four options that you can use to answer that question. Never, rarely, occasionally, or frequently. Hmm. The majority of the people that I work with say either never or rarely. And this is not just in you know a client population. I mean, when I do workshops just generally, and I even talk with my class, the classes I teach at the University of Wisconsin about anger and issues of anger, they say the same thing. So it turns out that I think, and this is a global, um, a global issue, because I certainly work with people from other countries. Uh, and when I ask them that question, they say the same thing. So globally, I don't think we have very good role models for how to express anger, particularly intense anger. So in a roundabout way, I would say to you that it is a pretty pretty large or immense problem. You know, I, I have something in my head, and I don't know where I got it. I knew it sounded very factual, that when we're really angry, whatever we say is stupid. Well, I wouldn't say that it's stupid meaning unintelligent, but oftentimes when we're really angry, we say things that are hurtful. We, we regret it. We have some remorse. We wish we could take it back. So I think more about functionality. Uh -huh. So when we're really angry, when we make the choice to be angry, it's not the anger that's oh. the problem anyway. It's how we express anger. Anger is just an emotion. It's just a feeling we get when we're dealing with something that's dissatisfying in our lives. But the problem is, because of that connection, when we see people are, who are angry, what are they generally doing? Well, they're yelling, they're, they're in road rage situations, tailgating, flipping people off, they're screaming, they're stomping out, they're using the silent treatment. The problem is, anger gets a bad rap. It's really a useful emotion. In fact, it's very instructive and very helpful. The because? Problem, because it can give you a cue to cope more effectively if you understand it that way. Unfortunately, what happens is we see anger expressed in ways that are, that are hurtful or non-functional or maladaptive. And so the connection between anger and its expression is very confused. I, I, if I may, I assume what you're saying is, tell me if I'm wrong, the constructive thing about anger is it tells you something's going on you've got to deal with? Exactly, or? exactly. Now, the other thing that most people don't, under, don't understand is that anger is a choice. You can decide not to be angry. And why is okay. that? It's because anger is not a primary emotion at all. It's a secondary emotion. Anger, we use anger functionally as a cover-up feeling. So when I work with people, I get them to, to, to identify what are the feelings underneath your anger. You were angry, but what was underneath it? Because we are, uh, particularly men, but women sometimes too, are socialized to put all of our feelings into this funnel. Sad, hurt, disappointed, betrayed. And it, and it funnels into anger because it's the one emotion we're taught we can express. So it's not at all a mystery to me that when people are feeling angry, what they're really feeling underneath that is maybe hurt or sadness or shame or disappointment, but it doesn't come out that way. It comes out as anger. Okay, well, let's say you're in a line in a supermarket and someone goes right in front of you. Right. You're saying anger is the secondary emotion? What's your primary? Like, my feelings are hurt? Or you might feel hurt. You might feel hurt? disrespected. You disrespected. might feel confused. Oh, okay. You might feel um, some righteous indignation that someone yes. would have the gall. But... That comes first, but it comes out as anger. Oh. And so you might raise your voice. You might. Uh, this happened in group. I was dealing with a group, and the other guy, and this very thing happened. A guy was in a convenience store. There was a line of about eight people. He was in a hurry, and a young woman comes and cuts in front of him, mm -hmm. about three, three up. And he blurts out, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. The rest of us are waiting, too. Well, it turns out that 
he felt hurt and disrespected and felt like she was doing a one-upsmanship that her time was more important than Wait a than minute. I would feel angry. If someone stepped right in front of me, I immediately That's go That's how anger. he came out as anger in a very obnoxious way. Okay. And what happened was he... I'm made, getting angry. He okay. made his behavior the focus of negative attention. And any time uh, you do that, oh. you give away your power. Oh. Turns out what happened is she was a daughter of a man who was already in line. Oh, and he boy. sent her out to the car to get something for him. He didn't see that. She came oh, back in and rejoined boy. him. He made the assumption, without checking it out, that she had cut in line. He blurts out something really not very nice. Yeah. And everybody's looking at him, not about what she did, but his method of dealing with it. Okay. Well, let's, let's say, people listening... Are in this happens to them. They're in line. Someone steps right in front of them. They have ninety nine point nine percent certainty this person was being rude and selfish. How should this whole thing go on in their head and their behavior if they take the Daryl Hanusa course? Well, how it goes on in their head is this: Wow, this is really interesting. Uh, I wonder why this person did that. Perhaps they're uh -huh. in a hurry. Maybe there's something I don't get here. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to make oh. a good request. And then the behavior is, excuse me, did you know that the line starts back there and you, and you just cut in front of me? Are let me you, challenge you. Are you aware well, of that? I'm sorry, but let me challenge you. It would seem to me that anger would come up within a millisecond and that maybe the anger is a trigger to say, slow down and then do what you said. Well, <clears throat> here's the thing. With time and with training, people are able to make the decision not to be angry. Oh, You don't have really? to get angry. Anger is a choice, and you can decide not to get angry if you identify first. If you get skilled at identifying the underlying feelings, like, mm. wow, that's, I'm confused by that, then you don't have to go to anger. Mm -hmm. You can if you want to, and even if you do, it's important to own your anger. The problem a lot of people um, uh, get into when they're expressing their anger is they say, you make me angry. Yes. That makes me angry. That's a myth. Let me challenge. Okay. No one I don't can, want to challenge It's called the myth of provocation. Oh. And, and you cannot be provoked to anger. You can make that choice. Now, it's not that people can't be antagonistic. We know that people can be antagonistic. But that defines them, not you. How you respond to it defines you. Okay. And let, so, let, there's an, so there's a situation where someone sorry. behaves in an antagonistic way. You have a choice. Now, I'm telling you this from lots of years of experience. And I'm telling you this based on people having said to me, in my assessment phase, there's no way... I swear to God, there's no way, whatever God they're swearing to, there's no way you can ever make me not be angry. Mm -hmm. And within about six weeks, when we talk, when we, when we do mm -hmm. our check-ins with success stories, they're saying, I had a quarrel with my partner or somebody at work, and I decided not to get angry. Hmm. I say, beg your pardon, what did you say? Wow. I decided not to get angry. Now, aren't you the person, Harry, that told me that there's no way that I would mm -hmm. ever be able to make mm -hmm. you, help you not be angry? Uh, yeah, I think I was. Good for you, Daryl. And so they're making those choices. Well, you so know, I, I want to flush this out for people listening, yeah. because I think if we give three or four examples of people who go, of course that would make me angry, and, and then show how you can do it differently and process it differently so you don't jump to anger, that would be instructive, I think. Well, and I would even challenge the phrase you just used. It doesn't make you angry. That's a choice right. you've made. Okay. okay. Anger comes, let's say, in, in your old mechanism before... You've received your right. course and, and workshop. Um, but things that almost always provoke unsophisticated uh, people about anger, um, certainly one is in traffic and getting cut off in traffic. Sure. sure. And if you get cut off in traffic or if someone is right on your butt tailgating, mm -hmm. most people would feel a, a rise in their blood pressure and the things that go with anger. Can you, through your course, get people to not feel that first response? Well, yes, I can, and here's how. Um, first of all, I think road rage, and I, I don't even call it road rage because I really don't think it's rage. It's really aggressive driving. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the same thing we're talking about here, but there's a little twist when we talk, talk about aggressive driving. There's two factors that really play out in aggressive driving that don't always play out in other, in other mechanisms. One is this belief that there's ownership on the road that you own that 30 feet in front of your car, behind your car, mm -hmm. and we have this protective mechanism and this entitlement that that's my space, how dare mm -hmm. somebody pull in front of me. The second thing that happens with aggressive drivers is anonymity. 
because uh-huh. nobody you don't know the person yes you think you can behave in any way you want to and you can get away with it funny story to tell you about that so i'm doing a group on uh, I, the program that i do is called auto aggression by the way it's for people who have aggressive driving tendencies and oh. man, have gotten themselves into trouble so i we're in group and this guy was sharing his, his story about why he was there and he said you know i was driving mm-hmm. home one day and some jerk pulled in front of me hardly gave me any space at all and I made the choice to be angry. And that wasn't his mm-hmm. term, but he right. said, I got pissed off. He yeah. pissed me off kind of thing. Because right. that's what people sure. say before they get some sure. training. And he said, I was so angry that I tailgated this guy and I flashed my lights and I flipped him off. And funny thing, I was following this guy and he was headed toward where I live. And he turned into my subdivision and I was right behind him. Not only did he not turn and just turn in my subdivision, he turned onto my street I'm thinking, oh, what's going on here? Uh-huh. It turns out it was his neighbor who had just gotten wow. a brand new car, and he didn't know that. And the guy pulls in his garage, his his house two doors down. Wow! And he said, I felt I could I could have died a million deaths, yeah. but because he didn't think he knew the person, yes. you you have that that protection from um, that secrecy, and so people behave in all kinds of ways that they would never think of behaving otherwise. So I'm in Naples, Florida, this winter. I'm driving along a 30 mile an hour street and there's a biker, bicyclist coming on one side, runners on another, and I realize I'm going to hit one or the other unless I go real slow and let Mm -hmm. one pass. As I slow down, the man behind me is laying on his horn and then passes me as he's holding his horn down and gives me, flips off at me and keeps going. Uh Well, I catch up to him at the next light. There's a red light. He's right in front of me. Here's what I did. I get out of my car, and I want to explain to him why I had to slow down. Mm -hmm. And I walked up to his car. He rolls down his window. And I said, sir, the reason I was going so slow is there were bikers and runners, and if I had kept going at the normal pace, I would have hit one of them. And he looks at me and says, get away from me, itch with a B, Uh and sweared and screamed Uh at me. What's going on with this guy? What's going on with these road rage people? Okay, I think that's, you know, that's... And and I didn't, I wasn't too smart, was I? Well... Uh, I don't know if you were smart or not, but it might have been a bit dangerous to get out of your car. Yeah. Because we know that people carry guns and other weapons in their car and you and, and utensils that they can use as weapons. So that probably wasn't... Okay. Why don't we first start with advice for people like me who are the victims of road rage? So, um, so again, it's part of what you think. And what I teach people in training is to have a different kind of, of self-enhancing thoughts. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, this person must really be in a hurry. Perhaps um, they're rushing to an emergency. Um, however they drive isn't about me. I'm happy to get out of his way or her way and, and let them take the road. Uh-huh. And you know what? Five minutes from now, I won't even remember this. Next yes. year, it won't even be in my, in my memory bank. But yet, we allow ourselves to get so enraged about something like that mm-hmm. because we feel like we've been... Um, it's our righteous indignation. How dare yes. them do that to me? Yes. I own that road. Right. So part of it is developing a different kind of mentality. Uh-huh. Because here's the thing. People, things, and situations cannot make us mad. People, things, and situations cannot make us mad. What we say to ourselves about those people, things, right. and situations, however, can. Right. So when an event happens, somebody pulls in front of you, flips you off, whatever, it's just an event in the universe. Right. It doesn't mean anything. It's what you say to yourself. Until you give it meaning. And the kind of meaning you give it. It's based on the sum total of your social learning okay. history. It's part of that, that SOB, I have to do something. I have to retaliate because he's offended me and that's the code? Or what, what kind that, of thing? That's the code of aggressive driving. I have a right to protect my territory. That's that entitlement piece. I own that. How dare them do this to me? Yeah, how dare I slow down? But yeah. also the, my reaction, I, I actually, I wasn't aggressive. I wanted to explain. You I wanted, wanted to explain. I wanted him to like me. Yeah. But <laughs> that's, a whole other, that's a whole other dialogue. Yes. Right? People right. pleasing. <laughs> right. But uh, in, in terms of what's going on, with the person who receives the aggression. Right. You're saying there's always a way of recoding it. Like- oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The people that I work with who have anger problems, what they, what they have to shift from is from a focus on themselves and their own wound or injury to an, an empathy kind of a statement about the other person versus uh-huh. they did that to me, how dare them, I'll show them to, oh, wow, I wonder what's up with them. Uh, they mm-hmm. must be in a hurry. I wonder if there's an emergency. Maybe there's something I don't know about. Maybe they didn't see that there were bikers up there. Maybe they don't care, but that's okay. How, how about compassion? 
they look like jerks, but they must be very troubled people. Exactly. It's that kind of empathic. So you get out of yourself and focus on, uh -huh. I'm the victim, poor me, to more of an attitude of what's going on for them. That concept is called name it and tame it, by the way. Ah, that's a bumper, did you make that up? That, I did. That's a bumper sticker phrase. Uh -huh. If you try to name what's going on with somebody else, you can't react in a similar fashion. They're mutually incompatible responses. So if you kind of go that old Columbo uh, uh -huh. television series, yep. you know, you used to I'm, go, huh. Mm -hmm. If you kind of do that, huh, I wonder what's going on with them that they're so angry with me that they'd lay on the horn and fly yes. off, huh. Yes. You can't at the same time go, that SOB, I'll get them back, this isn't right. fair to me. They're mutually incompatible responses. So if you, can, if you can name it, you can tame your reaction to it. Name it and tame it. Let's talk about men and women and their differences with anger. Okay. Where do you want to begin? Well, I think, the, I think one primary piece of that is how we're socialized. Um, I think men are taught to get it out, to express it. Men are taught to be more aggressive in, in how they code anger. And, women, and men are given less permission in our culture to express all the other feelings. So no God-fearing, self-respecting man would ever share with another man that he feels sad or afraid or hurt based on an interaction. Mm -hmm. It comes out as anger, irritability, retaliation, counterattack. Yeah. Women in our culture generally, now I'm talking in general, in general stereotypes here, women are more encouraged and given permission to explore other emotions. Sure. Men really aren't. So part of the trick of treatment, of course, is to engage men in learning from becoming emotionally illiterate to emotionally literate. Hmm. I'm teaching them the vocabulary of mo if emotions so that they don't have to channel everything into anger. So they can go, ouch, that really hurt, or I really felt sad when you said that to me. Or I'm confused by that. What did you mean when How you said that? How the heck do you teach them that? Lots of practice. And, 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 and what happens is the best part of teaching it is when they use it the first time and it works for them. Oh. All of a sudden it's like, Wow, this really works. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by works? I don't mean that other people then miraculously give them what they want. Mm -hmm. What I mean is I define successes as their ability to express their feelings and ask what they want in a firm, matter-of-fact manner without making their behavior the focus of negative attention. Because when you make your behavior the focus of negative attention, you lose every time. Define that, would you? Give me an example. Okay, so let's say that... <clears throat> I say something to you that you don't like. Mm -hmm. And it's really maybe not even a very nice thing. Yeah. And in response to that, you start screaming at me and yelling at me and yes. kick me out of your office. Yeah. All of a sudden, you've, made, you've trumped me. You've done a one-upsmanship. And you made your behavior the focus of negative attention. Mm -hmm. You overused the power you had to try to prove your point. But now the issue is lost and your behavior is the focus. So you have a short-term gain. You, you get force and you got to get revenge or whatever, right. save face, but the long-term, exactly. you've lost. Exactly. Exactly. You so burn bridges. Right. And so the definition then of success is to be able to express what you want and your feelings without making your behavior the focus of negative attention. Oh, okay. So you, it your, stands your to reason that you're going to get more of what you want from other people when you do that. Your boss is looking at an assignment you did, and he said, you know, Daryl, sometimes you really do things poorly, almost like an idiot. React. You know what? You're right. Sometimes I do. Oh. Don't always, I don't always... Um, spend the time that I, uh, that I need to to get all the I's dotted and the ah. T's crossed. And I really you know, would like to hear more about that. I'm kind of confused by what you're specifically talking about. Can we go over this together? How's you your blood pressure me? while you're doing that? Perfect. Really? Perfect. Why? Why? Because I have made the choice not to take that as an affront. Why would How do I? you do that so fast? Boom, comes the affront, and you're already calm? Right. Doesn't that take a minute of adjustment? Not really, because when you've practiced... A whole series of the sequence, relaxation practice. I have the tools. See, the confidence that people get in learning how to deal with, with anger is that they have the tools in their toolbox to deal with any situation. So my boss says, or somebody says, you know, this is really a piece of crap. I don't know where you learned to write English, uh, but, but I can't even <laughs> understand. Good. You can't uh -huh. even put a sentence back to back and make sense. Good. Uh, and I say, okay, well, I'm a little bit confused by what you're talking about. Uh -huh. um, can we go over this together? Wow. And then if they say, well, here's what I'm talking about. Now, if it's right, I'm going to mm -hmm. use the FU, the fessing up technique. Oh. You know what? You're right. I didn't realize uh, uh -huh. how poorly that sounds. Yeah. But thanks for you know pointing that out. And I'll go back and revise it, and can we try this again? What if I don't agree with them? 
What if they're giving uh -huh. me uh, a line of stuff that I just don't agree with? Then I would use a comeback that's an empathy response. So, Dick, it sounds like you're really disappointed with my writing here because to you it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then you would respond more. And you'd say, yeah, here's what I mean by that. And then we work out a negotiation. But I have the tools, see, and, and, and I don't have to go to anger because I have the tools for knowing how to respond to that. Part of it is when you don't know what else to do and you feel criticized, one way to get people out of your face is to become angry and use a, a, an yes. abusive behavior. Uh -huh. But that's a lot of that's tied to some underlying stuff as well, like shame, for instance. I mean, shame is the message we get that we are a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so when it says to, well, you I know, see. that's really a piece of crap, Dick. Where did you learn to even write like that? And in your family or somewhere along the line, people who are authority figures told you that, you know, you're not going to amount to anything. Mm -hmm. Don't even think about doing X, Y, Z. You know, you might as well go out and drive a truck or, or whatever it is that feels like a put down to you. Then you're going to respond with that kind of an intense reaction if you don't know what else. Because it's a put down of your whole being exactly. rather than that particular act. Exactly. This says that you are a mistake, not that you've made a mistake. Now, what about the difference in education? Are, are people just as likely to be... Uh, bad at anger if they're well-educated as if they're not? That's really a good question. I, I don't see a whole lot of difference between people who are based on their level of education. I mean, I really see a cross-section of people. I work with people who are um, high school educated, some people who don't even have that. They have GEDs. Mm -hmm. I work with college professors, bank wow. presidents, chiefs of police. I work with um, attorneys. It just it just amazing okay. to me. So no one is insulated or isolated from um, from that area of dealing with anger badly. How about self-esteem and anger management? Well, I, I think part of what happens, I don't deal with self-esteem directly, mm -hmm. but what I see is when people are confident about their ability to deal with interpersonal conflict mm -hmm. constructively, guess what happens to their self-esteem? Oh. It goes up. Oh, that's interesting. Their confidence yeah. improves, their self-esteem improves, their depression goes down, and I have over 30 years of data to support that because I do a lot of data uh, collection when I when I do my work. So I have pre-tests, mid-tests, and post-tests, and what I see is that people come in, there is some self -esteem, there are self-esteem issues, there's some depression issues, and as they get more confident in being able to deal with conflict constructively, the depression scores go down, their self-esteem scores go up, they're more confident, and they're having more successes, generally assertive successes in, in their lives. Girl. Yeah, That's great. Now let's talk about dealing with others' anger. It's someone you're living with. Well, that might be an extreme example. What do you want to start with? Someone you're living with or work with? It doesn't or matter. Why don't you start? Okay, let's talk about... It uh, really doesn't make any difference oh. except for one little piece. What's that? <clears throat> well, the piece is when we're dealing with people we live with, we have a different level of expectation mm -hmm. about how they're supposed to treat us. <clears throat> so, for instance, most people would never treat a boss how they would treat their partner. Uh -huh. Why is that? You've never said, you'd never say that to your boss. Well, why not? Well, they could fire me. Mm -hmm. Now, your partner can fire you, too. It's called a divorce. Yes. <clears throat> but it usually takes more, there's more lag time in that whole process. Uh -huh. but, but the mechanisms are roughly the same. Mm -hmm. So what I teach people about how to deal with other people's anger, first of all, to start with calming your own response. Mm. Because our immediate response from the limbic system yes. is to do what? Is to fire back yes. or something. So I teach a lot of relaxation skills, a lot of self-talk to teach people that your first response in your head needs to be, Take a breath, just be calm and relaxed. Be calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. That's your first response. Then to deal with somebody else's anger, depends upon how they're saying it. If they're just giving the broad brush shotgun approach to anger, then ask about it. So what's okay. going on here? I don't understand what's happening. Or use a technique called anger starvation. Two-step process. You acknowledge their anger using an empathy statement. Dick, I can see you're really angry with me because I forgot mm -hmm. to leave you the key as mm -hmm. I promised and you couldn't yeah. get in last night. How about if I buy you a cup of coffee and let's sit down and I'll explain mm -hmm. what happened last night. Do you have time to do that? So it's a two-step process. I don't accuse you of being angry. Mm -hmm. I don't counterattack. I don't deny it. And I don't minimize it. What I do is acknowledge it, that you have a legitimate right to be angry. I can see that you're angry because I forgot to drop the key off, like I said I was right. going to. The second layer is to offer some time to, to deal with it, to have a dialogue. So it's not getting swept under the table. Then it has a second level of empathy to it, because I'm saying to you, this is an important issue, and 
Time is valuable in our in our culture. What sure. do we say? Time is money. So I'm saying to you, I value this issue in you enough that I'm willing to take some time to talk about this and explain what happened. I'm hearing a technique. Tell me if this fits. When someone's mad at you, look for what they're right about and agree, what you can find to defuse the situation. Well, see, the nice thing about empathy, when you use empathy as an icebreaker, as an opener, you're not agreeing, you're not disagreeing. Oh. I can see that you're angry with me because I forgot to drop the key off last night. Now, you could do a fessing up in there as well. You know what? You're right. I really did blow it if you want to. And then you go to that. My anger would go down a lot faster if you said that than I could see you're angry. So, so try to push against my hand. Okay. Oh. Try to push. And, yeah, he's pushing his hand away before right. I get there. So, if you, that's, so there's no yeah. resistance. If yeah. I don't give you any resistance, it's hard for you to continue. Mm, I see. If, 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 if you push so your hand. So even saying I'm hearing you're angry is not resistance. That's right. Rather than, well, it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. So underneath that, I'm hearing don't defend yourself. Exactly. You don't need to. There's really no need to. It's like I'm, I'm trying to hear where you're coming from, you know. And then if you don't agree that you, that you, that you were going to put the key out, then you can deal that when it's your turn. Okay. See, so how did we get to this point, Dick? You think I agreed to put the key out, and, you know, mm -hmm. I have no memory of that. Okay. Um, how, you're late for lunch. The person comes, is sitting there. You're 25 minutes late, and the person says, so what happened? And let's say, in fact, you, you were a little negligent. Then you say, you know what, I have no excuse. I just totally blew it. I, I should have checked my schedule. I totally forgot. And you're right. I am a half an hour late. How about okay. if I make it up to you? Can I buy you lunch? Perfect. So makeup is a good thing. How about you're living with a, a man who blames you for everything. He's uh -huh. crabby, and if he has a bad experience, it's your fault. Uh -huh. If he does badly, didn't do his job at work, well, it's your fault if you had made dinner better last yeah. night. So you're really angry with me because you think if I would have made dinner last night, you would have had a better day at work. Is that it? Uh, okay. I get it. And then now the, now the ball's in your court, and uh -huh. you would have a chance to respond to that. Yeah, and furthermore, you know, if you would have done X, Y, Z better, then I would have had a better day. Okay. And so then, then you get your turn. After you feedback with, with that response, then you get your turn, and you would say, well... I'm hearing that you're really unhappy about what happened at work today, and I'm hearing that you think if I did these things better, you would have had a better day, and I'm confused by that. Uh -huh. How? How? What? Help me with that connection. If I would have made a better dinner, how would you have had a better day at work? I'm assuming you have to watch your volume and your tone. How you say what you say is just as important as what you say. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my training with people is not only the spoken word, but it's the nonverbal presentation as well. I do a lot of work on teaching people about body language. Tone of voice is part of that, absolutely. What is there a male-female difference in tone of voice and showing anger? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think. Oh, really? I think when women reach that point where they make the choice to be angry, they can have an eleva elevated voice. Uh, I think women just aren't capable, maybe, of raising the decibel level. Some women oh, aren't in okay. general, but certainly I see a lot of commonality in that. But I think you asked me what's the difference between men and women, and uh -huh. I think women again are taught to, to be the anger retentives. They uh -huh. stuff it inside. Uh -huh. That's not healthy either. That takes a horrible toll. And sometimes they do the boo boo, they b u b u, build up, blow up. Yes. And so it reaches that point where they go from passive, they're stuffing it and stuffing it until they can't. They make the choice to be angry because it seems like there's too much pile-up stuff going on. So what on. do you need to teach them? To say it so they don't play it. That's another bumper <laughs> sticker phrase. Right. Say it or play it. Okay. Say how you're feeling at the time when you're having that feeling so you don't have to play it out later on in a way that's maladaptive or makes your behavior the focus of negative attention. Do you have a favorite book for people on anger? Um, you know, I, there's a lot of books out there. I think a book by, um, actually, a Wisconsin native, uh, Ron Potter Efron, mm -hmm. uh, is, is a good book about anger. And he's written, actually, uh, two or three books now in his Ron series. Ron Potter Efron. Mm -hmm. Okay. And before we leave you, Daryl, if you could lay out the tips so people can walk away with those tips. One, how to control your outbursts, step by step. Okay. First of all, part of it is an understanding that you don't lose control, you choose control. Because anger expressed aggressively is about trying to control a situation or another person. Okay. Understand that provocation is a myth and you have a choice to be angry. It's okay if you want to be angry, but there are primary feelings underneath it. And really work hard on under understanding the feelings underneath. Practice some relaxation. Figure out ways to calm yourself. When there's a critical moment, 
one of the best ways that you can respond to that is by not saying anything right away. So calm yourself. Give yourself that nanosecond of time to think about how you're feeling and what you want to say. And then learn some tools or techniques that you can use to express your feelings to deal with other people's anger. So those are some tips that I would suggest. Daryl and Lisa, this is just uh, very instructive. You've packed a lot to a half hour, and uh, I hope you come back again. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.